No, it's not the system. It's just those three guys. We just have to get those three guys. It just didn't compute to our 1990s brains. What, what's really driving it is the fear of being capitalist roadkill. Hi, I'm Naomi Klein, and I'm here at Penguin to answer some big questions. Algorithms are mimicry machines, right? In the same way that AI is more broadly a mimicry machine. So it just gives us more of what we just had. It's a house of mirrors, really. All the algorithms are a house of mirrors. You know, we've all had that experience of like, okay, well, maybe I wanted to watch that one video, but does that mean I want to watch 10 videos just like it? This is a loop that we're in, and loops don't tend to be very healthy. I guess the other way that I worry about the um, the way algorithms are changing us is just the currency of um, the attention economy, right? Of likes, of retweets. They're value-free measurements, right? In the same way that money is. And the, the question is not like, was this insightful? Was it correct? It's how many, how much, right? So that's sometimes referred to as clout online. And what clout measures is is not is it good? Is it bad? Is it true? Is it false? It's how much bulk you-ness there is in the world. I say in the book, like, if influence sways, clout just squats. <laughs> and I think that what that does is it, if that's the currency of the online economy, it selects for a certain type of personality that really needs a lot of attention um, for whatever reason. The attention economy rewards the part of ourselves that wants the attention, that wants to see our name, that wants that validation. And it changes us. I think it does change us. I think we can all, we all know people who have been changed. I've been changed. Like I've watched it change my, you know, my, my, my research habits. The reason why I did this study of my doppelganger is I think she's emblematic of of, of something that's happening much more broadly in the culture, which is people are changing. You know, my, my doppelganger is very different than she used to be. And I know lots of people who have changed a lot. And everybody I talk to about this is like, oh God, I can't talk to my uncle anymore. I can barely even talk to my sister. My grandmother won't get off Facebook. You know? So we, we're all having this experience of, of not just the world changing, but people we know and love changing and seeming almost beyond the reach of, of love or reason. And so I thought it would be interesting to try to figure out, you know, what, what are the mechanisms that are, that are leading to this huge change? Conspiracies have been mainstream at, at, at various points in history. I don't think we are in entirely new uncharted territories. I think that, that conspiracy theories play particular roles in our mental architecture and in our social relations. I mean, one thing that conspiracy theories do is distract us from, from unbearable reality. So a lot of my work um, has been about the climate crisis. And if I look at climate change denial, which is a conspiracy theory, right? The reason that conspiracy has gotten traction is a combination of the fact that there are very powerful vested interests in our society that don't want us to focus on the real causes of, of the warming because it would threaten their entire business model, that being the fossil fuel companies that have underwritten that conspiracy theory. But also just the reality that, you know, like Al Gore said back in the day, it is an inconvenient truth in that it does require change from us. It's always easier to f take a flight into fantasy than it is to confront a difficult reality. And so I think that COVID was also a difficult reality and it asked difficult things of us. We also live in a society that tends to turn to individual responses as opposed to more difficult collective responses, right? So our, our neoliberal governments were more likely to tell us to wear a mask and get vaccinated than they were to say, Let's make sure that every worker has sick leave, has enough money to stay home if they need to. Let's make sure that our kids go to schools with lots of great ventilations. These are all possible responses our governments could have had to COVID. And we st still would have needed to wear masks and get vaccinated, but they put everything onto those individual responses and really neglected those collective responses that would have made it easier. 
many people weren't supported by the programs that were supposed to support people to stay home, right? And so a lot of people chose fantasy and just chose to believe that COVID was a conspiracy. What's interesting about studying COVID conspiracy theories is that they're not really theories, like they're just a, a range of plots most of which contradict each other, right? So one of them is COVID is a biological weapon developed in a lab by the Chinese in order to wipe out the West. Also, don't wear a mask, which is weird because if it's a biological weapon, you'd think you would take precautions. And then also the vaccines are a bioweapon, right? So it's just like, well, is it COVID that's the bioweapon or is it, it doesn't matter. It's just generally the moral of the story is you don't need to do anything. You don't need to stay home, don't need to wear the mask, you don't need to get vaccinated. Conspiracy theories get the facts wrong, but they often get the feelings right. And the feeling is something's being hidden from us. Something doesn't add up. Like, you know, there is impunity for the powerful. Rather than seeing a system, you know, and I'm somebody who's been studying the system of capitalism for my, you know, all through all of my books, that's really what they're all about. Conspiracy says, no, it's this, it's Fauci, it's Schwab, it's this meeting in Davos. And so this is <laughs> the other reason why conspiracies are threat are, are, are spreading now and becoming so mainstream. Even though conspiracy theorists always talk about the elites, the elites, they're after you. The people who conspiracy theories benefit most are the elites <laughs> because it deflects attention away from the system that has made them billionaires. And it says, no, it's not the system. It's just those three guys. We just have to get those three guys. It's a system protecting framework, conspiracy theories. That's why uh, conspiracy theories are often play on racial and ethnic stereotypes, right? They break apart potential coalitions from below. You know, for me, the, the question of whether or not we can be ourselves online is really hard to pick apart from this idea of what the self is for more broadly in, in our culture. Almost 25 years ago now, I published a book called No Logo, which was about the rise of branding uh, in the corporate world. And this was just the very beginning of this idea that it isn't just corporations like Nike or Starbucks that should be brands, but individuals should also be brands. When I wrote that book, that seemed like an absolutely absurd idea. <laughs> like it, because it's one thing for a celebrity to be a brand because they can afford to promote that brand. They have p publicists and they have PR consultants, they have stylists, but normal workers in the economy don't have any of those things. It just didn't compute to our 1990s brains. And of course the game changer is social media because it puts at our fingertips, this huge marketing potential. If you've got the phone, it's pretty much free. But I don't think you can pry apart the, the, the idea that people are performing kind of branded versions of ourselves online from the broader economic insecurity and precarity that produced this idea that this is all we have, right? That the, a, a, and so I don't like just blaming it on social media or just blaming it on the algorithms. Because I think that if what's really driving it is terror, what, what's really driving it is the fear of being capitalist roadkill. I, I know a lot of people who do kind of social media, not out of addiction, but out of a sense of, of, of duty um, and fear that, that if they don't do it, if they don't have a brand, if they don't perform themselves, which is not themselves, which is something for the consumption of others. It's an, it's an idealized version of oneself, whether that's like, you know, a beautiful idealized perfect life version or an aggressive narcissistic racist version to a different niche audience, right? It's still a kind of a partitioned performed version designed to get that attention, to get the likes, to get the views, to get the clout, which in turn, you know, is not just about the likes, it's, it, it, it's monetizable. You know, I think we need a real public commons. I mean, I think we need a real information commons. We're circling around, oh, that 
platform used to be good and it used to have real, I mean, this is the story for everyone, you know, Tumblr and Twitter and yeah, early TikTok where it was smaller and it, and it was a more of a space for experimentation and a place for people who would not have had access to large audiences or even just meeting people who are like them. So I don't want to say that there's no value in it. I think there is real value, but I think that this pattern of, and then it gets really big, and then we don't understand the algorithm, and then people start getting canceled and ejected, and we don't, you know, this happens again and again because these are not democratic spaces at all. They are black box algorithms, and by black box, you know, I mean that we don't understand, and it's proprietary, how these decisions get made about what's going to be lifted up, what's going to be suppressed. I mean, this is why things like the Twitter files have gotten, uh, you know, a lot of traction, a lot of attention, because it's a look behind the curtain. The solution is not to have like one of the richest men in the world leak documents to a few of his handpicked, you know, friends. It is to have a democratically controlled internet. Um, this The internet was developed by the US government uh, originally. It's a process of enclosing the commons, of enclosing the, the, these these publicly developed tools and allowing a handful of individuals to get unfathomably rich from them and using the discourse of the commons of the public sphere in order to sell these products back to us. I think we should actually think about what it would mean to have democratically controlled social media um, and prioritize that. Well, I think that the impact on our work lives um, and income is much more pressing and more immediate than the sort of far off, like, will AI wipe out humanity and sort of the, the, the sort of sci-fi fears that people in tech tend to focus on. And it's a bit of a distraction because you're debating this question of like, are robots going to kill all humans like in the Terminator movies? And in the meantime, you're not talking about the fact that people are already losing their incomes. And I think the people developing these technologies know that. That's why a lot of them start talking about basic income or, well, maybe we shouldn't be working so much anyway. And it's like, well, well, sure. Um, <laughs> but, but then let's talk about overthrowing capitalism. Let's not talk about AI, because if you're talking about AI under capitalism, that's not what's going to happen. We're not all going to be paid to stay home, and we are not all going to be able to lead lives of leisure because, you know, AI has taken away all the drudgery. What's going to happen is that people are going to be discarded in the same way that they are discarded now, only in much, much greater numbers. So we have to, you know, I think, check the fantasy at the door and really look at what does AI look like under this very brutal stage of capitalism. Thanks for watching. You can get my book Doppelganger in hardback, ebook, and audio by clicking the link in the description below. Don't forget to click here to subscribe to Penguin and get more videos like this one.